that you could win. I don't have to win. We both just have to lose. So the third and maybe final installment in the Ant-Man solo saga is right around the corner, and I'm more excited for this one than any of the previous outings. Even though it looks about as visually pleasing as the last couple of MCU movies, and the majority of the action is a green screen candy land, the story feels like it will finally put Scott Lang to the test with a true baddie to play with. Kang is supposedly the Thanos of the multiverse saga, with huge shoes to fill, probably like a size 30, Nathaniel Richards is already captivating in what little we've seen from the marketing so far. Giving Team Ant-Man a proper villain would have fixed one of the key issues with the first two Ant-Man movies, but that wouldn't save them from being dull outliers released during some of the best years of the MCU to date. Ant-Man and the Wasp held the trophy for worst MCU movie for a good few years. Scott Lang himself, on the other hand, has proven time and time again that he's one of the most likeable and engaging MCU heroes. I think he's excellently used in the team-up movies, but his solo movies always leave something to be desired. Why is that? What works about Ant-Man alongside the Avengers that just doesn't translate to his titular vehicles? And can Quantum Mania finally break the curse? What do you think of Ant-Man as a character? What do you think of the Ant-Man movies? Am I being too harsh? Are you excited for Quantum Mania? And do you think it will be good? Do you think it will be the best Ant-Man movie so far? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like more Marvel videos, then be sure to subscribe and check out my wealth of MCU videos. The Wasp might be cool, but bees are much better. They're less aggressive and much cuter. Ah, bees. The bees! Yep, bees. What's that? Organic sponsor segue? Be kind. Be Kind is an adorable brand of bee-themed jewellery and novelties. They make a perfect gift for that special someone in your life, especially with Valentine's Day coming up. They've got earrings and necklaces, some of which I'm displaying for you here very lovely. They sent me some, some free samples. Be Kind Rewind. <laughs> Get it? Ten percent of every purchase made on the Be Kind website is donated to help develop bee colonies and provide them with the best possible conditions. In partnership with Bee Friendly Farming, a certification program from Pollinator Partnership, working with farmers to help protect, preserve, and promote pollinator health. Did I also mention the free shipping and eco-friendly packaging? I didn't. Well, now I have. Visit Be Kind through the link in my description and enter my code Full Fat for twenty percent off. Ants. And man, by the way, that is the greatest promo Marvel has ever produced. Development on Ant-Man began as early as 2005, with the Cornetto trilogy's Edgar Wright infamously attached to direct. He was the guy that pushed for this character to get a big budget movie in the first place, and he was reportedly excited by the prospect because he felt the character had an interesting skill set and movie going audiences weren't as familiar with him. Wright felt like he could inject his style and vision into the movie without audiences already having an idea of what they want in their heads, as is the case with more established heroes like Spider-Man and Batman. But as Wright developed the project with frequent collaborator Joe Cornish, the the MCU and superhero movies in general changed tremendously. He went from potentially making a director-driven sci-fi adventure to a more standardized superhero movie in the house style of the MCU. Edgar Wright left Marvel's Ant-Man last week because of vague creative differences. Latino Review claims the split between Wright and Marvel occurred because of screenplay issues. The Disney-owned studio apparently issued a handful of notes for Edgar Wright and co-writer Joe Cornish. The notes address points such as the core morality of the piece and including franchise characters. Wright and Cornish reportedly produced two new drafts of the Ant-Man script that they felt answered Marvel's questions without compromising their vision. Marvel reportedly took the script and put it in the laps of two low-credit writers. And once that version found its way back into Wright's lap, he walked. The new screenplay was, quote, poorer, homogenized, and not Edgar's vision. <laughs> Kevin Feige and his top lieutenants run Marvel with a singularity of vision. They don't want you to speak up too much or have too much vision. But when you take a true auteur and throw him into the mix, this is what you get. 
Of course, we'll likely never know the minutia of why exactly right left, or what the final straw was. It was such gutting news at the time because, much like James Gunn, it felt like Wright had a really guiding hand over his Super O project, and it would be hard to envision it without his trademarks. Joss Whedon tried to put the Wasp into the first Avengers movie when it looked like Scarlett Johansson's reprisal of Widow was up in the air. Could you imagine how different the MCU would have been if Widow never got a second go-round, and the Wasp became a core member of the Avengers instead, preceding an Ant-Man movie by several years? It's really hard to picture now that so many of the movies are predicated on certain team-ups and relationships sliding together. This kind of juggling probably didn't appeal to Wright. Ant-Man eventually hit theatres under Peyton Reed in summer 2015. It wasn't the disaster everyone thought it was going to be, there's certainly fun to be had in Scott Lang's first outing, but it's a movie that always leaves me feeling somewhat unsatisfied. Well, if that's the case, uh, shoot me again. You can see the traces of Wright's development across the board, from the casting to the heist premise, the idea to start with the second Ant-Man and focus on Pym in his old age, that's all really interesting. You know, the idea to make Ant-Man a heist movie structure was all Edgar and Joe. The idea of uh, Hank Pym and Scott Lang as mentor and pupil, uh, again, that was all theirs. Also, the idea of a movie that, that all drives toward a third act where the big battle between the good guy and the bad guy takes place in a little girl's bedroom. Uh, that was always there from the beginning, and I, I, I stand by the fact that I think that's genius. I love it. Uh Everything that's inspired about it is fighting against the ho-hum direction and the more predictable plot contrivances. It's not! You son of a bitch! Scott Lang never met the Falcon in Wright's version, which isn't at all surprising. Ant-Man. What, you haven't heard of me? No, you wouldn't have heard of me. It's a fun scene, Mackie and Rudd being two of the funniest actors in the franchise, but it does feel like a trailer for the next team-up movie, the same way Thor's Ultron cave sequence felt like a tease for better, more engaging Avengers movies to come. One thing we definitely know is that Wright pushed for the casting of Paul Rudd as Ant-Man. That in and of itself solidifies the director's stamp on this MCU character, because it's one of the best casting decisions in the franchise. Rudd is a comedy veteran, and seeing him take on the role of the everyman turned superhero really sells us on some of the more haggard material he's been saddled with over the years. Also a slam dunk, casting Michael freaking Douglas as Hank Pym. I want you to break into a place and steal some shit. With Evangeline Lilly as the Wasp, there's no doubt that this is a perfectly cast Pym trio. Hank's grumpy old man, Shtick, and Hope's tightly wound mentor slash love interest both play off of goofball Lang really well. That's how you punch. And hey, I love Scott's buddies too. Michael Pena, of course, being the highlight there. Abstract expressionism exhibit, but you know me, I'm more like a Neil Cubist kind of guy, right? But there was this one Rothko that was sublime, bro. The casting is brilliant, but it seems like all those decisions were made before Wright left. I think it becomes more apparent as the movies go on that the casting was so good to the point it upheld the gaps in this series. He said, yeah, no! I don't think Ant-Man illuminates the problem with Lang's character, because it's largely an origin tale and so he has a clear-cut arc, even if that arc isn't particularly groundbreaking. Scott goes through change and has some genuine issues that neatly set up his character. He's out of prison, he can't get a job, he can't pay his bills, he can't pay his child support, he can't keep down a new job, his ex is now dating a cop, and of course, they don't get along. I love that he's an ex-con, and now she's getting married to a cop. His life is hilarious. This doesn't have the depth of Raimi's Spider-Man woes, but in terms of pressuring our protagonist and giving him some sympathetic problems, it's some nice stuff. To its credit, the final third does have some good tension. Scott hurling himself down the metal tube whilst Kurt tries to hit the button is really fun. Wait, what? What do you mean, wait? And it leads straight into the standoff, the original test footage now fully realised, and the helicopter chase. The third act makes great use of the size changing, notably giving us a giant Thomas the Tank Engine, a regular tank engine, and of course, a giant ant. <laughs> That's a messed up looking dog. But just imagine the direction of the heists under Edgar Wright. They would have had so much more energy and style to them. He was coming off the back of a killer streak with Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> Imagine what more of a bump this would have had with some absolutely stellar direction and editing in keeping with Wright's frenetic style. The Latino Review report stating the morality was an issue for Disney makes me think the crux of Lang being a thief and an ex-con would have been far more multi-layered and challenging. There's no doubt in my mind that Joe Cornish and Edgar Wright had the superior script, as much as I love Mackie in all his forms. I'd kill to see the Edgar Wright Ant-Man movie in a parallel timeline. Maybe that's going to be the culmination of the multiverse saga, you know? Feige's just going to announce that everything feeds into finally getting that top-tier superhero movie that never was. 
Peyton Reed stepped in to oversee production of the movie, and I think he did a fine job. He's a competent director that knows how to construct a story. It's not like he isn't talented, but there's also a level of vision that comes with Edgar Wright that just says to me Reed was not the guy to move ahead with. Ant-Man 2 should have gotten a new director or directing team, a la the Russos on Winter Soldier or Watiti on Ragnarok. Marvel just about pulled this off in its canon state, but from there Ant-Man goes from a potential lead in the series to being a supporting, albeit fun, side character. He holds his own in team-up movies, but what arc is there to speak of? Who are you? Come on, man. I think it's fair to say that none of us would be here and, and there might not even be an Ant-Man movie if it weren't for Edgar and Joe. The potential of Ant-Man on screen was conceived by Wright. Without him, his solo series was left creatively floundering. Had he not pulled out so close to production, I wonder whether Marvel would have bothered with Ant-Man solo movies that early on. He feels closer to Widow and Hawkeye in phases 1-3, to three, integral to their appearances, but still just team players to complement the leading title characters. It didn't have to be that way. I believe this is yours, Captain America. Civil War. Paul Rudd only really has an extended cameo in Civil War, and unlike Spider-Man, there wasn't much buzz around his character being in the movie. I want motion pictures of Spider-Man! We'd seen him less than a year earlier, we'd already seen him meet an Avenger, whatever. So I think it was such a nice surprise that Scott ended up being one of the best things about the movie. He really shines because he's one of the few characters in Team Cap with more bespoke abilities. Most of them are brawlers with tech and gear enhancements. Aside from the Scarlet Witch, Ant-Man is the only character that allows for some unique visuals. Scott Loki steals all the best scenes in the airport battle. Highlights include sucker punching Spider-Man, <laughs> almost killing War Machine. Oh, come on! Oh man, I thought it was a water truck. Flying atop one of Hawkeye's arrows and shutting down Tony's suit. You gotta, you're gonna have to take this into the shop. Who's speaking? It's your conscience. Then there is, of course... I got something kind of big, but I can't hold it very long. Scott goes from being an underestimated rookie to being the game-changing ace in the hole. He sweeps at Black Panther like it's nothing, he flings buses, he's a force to be reckoned with. It takes Spider-Man and a twin punch from both Iron Man and War Machine to take him down. <laughs> This scene is a great way of showcasing just how versatile and useful the Pym Particle power set is, and what better way to show it off than by having him body multiple series leads. This is hands down the best time Giant Man was ever used in the MCU. It's just kind of a joke in the Ant-Man sequel, and there's not enough in Endgame, although watching him punch a Leviathan is awesome. Civil War also kind of steals Ant-Man and the Wasp's thunder. You'd think Giant Man would be the prime thing to do in his sequel, but of course in the MCU you have characters dipping into other films between their sequels, so Giant Man manifests here instead. But that's okay, I'm sure they won't run out of ideas. Something just flew in me! Ant-Man and the Wasp. Ant-Man sat out of Avengers Infinity War entirely, but his notable absence only made his appearance in Avengers Endgame one of the highlights of that movie. You're repeating yourself. You're repeating yourself. You're repeating yourself. Dude. You know, no. Come you on. Never However, Lang did of course make his presence felt that same summer as Infinity War, with one of the biggest MCU belly flops of all time. Marvel was on a hot streak across 2017 and 2018. We went from Guardians 2 to Homecoming to Ragnarok to Black Panther to Avengers Infinity War. All great entries that did different things, and didn't get bogged down by being three hours longer and divided up onto Disney+. Ant-Man and the Wasp thundered into screens just a few months after Panther and Infinity War, grinding that streak to a halt. This movie is neither particularly bad or good, it's just incredibly dull and boring, the worst crime of all. The action isn't up there with the rest of the MCU, the characters don't face much pressure, the central idea of finding Janet Van Dyne is all surface level, and it just kind of chugs along without much rhyme or reason. This movie could have been wiped from the slate, and the only truly important thing you'd need to see would be the post credit scene. Quit screwing around, you told me yourself not to screw around. Hank! Ridiculous. Walton Goggins, Lawrence Fishburne and Hannah John Cameron all take turns playing bad guy and all of them are wasted and wafer thin in the characterization department. How do you waste the villain talents of Walton Goggins? How do you take a voice as rich as Fishburne's and give him the lamest lines of exposition? It's quantum entanglement. Entanglement. Between the quantum states of Posner molecules in your brains. How do you take a promising new character in Kamin's ghost, give her some unique powers, and then give her the most generic villain motivation imaginable? What do you think? You like my exquisite, uh, exquisite erection? Marvel touted this as a rom-com, which excited me because focusing on the romance between the two title characters and making that the driving force of the movie would have truly made it stand out from the rest of the MCU. <laughs> Instead, the romance is about as prominent as any other MCU adventure. The Wasp's big debut isn't particularly exciting because the plot is just a whole humstring of events leading to Michelle Pfeiffer's return. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. On that note, 
The biggest problem with the movie is a lack of tension. Hank Pym's journey into the quantum realm to rescue Janet is way too quick and painless. The concept art showed the team entering the realm and facing off against comparatively gigantic germs and whatnot, and that looked awesome. We could have had a really cool, trippy back half to this movie. Ant-Man and the Wasp should have accompanied Pym and the trio, and they should have gone on a properly dangerous odyssey to get Janet back. Plus, in that time, it would have been nice to pepper the film with even more flashbacks of her, or more time spent with Hank and Hope mourning her loss, because her eventual return doesn't hit me emotionally anywhere near as well as it could have. Oh, jelly bean. <laughs> I already know I'm going to get comments saying they held off on the quantum realm for the third movie, but I can already tell you that's a cop out of an excuse. You could have easily done something more interesting with Hank's quantum realm journey in the second film without spoiling the premise of quantum mania. The quantum realm is a big place with lots to explore, or rather it's a really tiny place, a really, really tiny place with lots to explore, but you get the point. The most compelling story has to happen in the movie we're watching right now. If you save cool things for the next one, it makes me think you don't have a lot of cool ideas in the back pocket. James Gunn went straight to Star-Lord's father in Volume 2, and guess what? There's clearly still loads of interesting ideas being mined for Volume 3. You don't need to hold off and keep it chugging along with the bare bones in the meantime. The house arrest isn't tense enough either. Jimmy Woo should be on their tail, becoming slowly aware of the fact that no, Scott is not in the house, he should be pressuring the action in the same way Sonny Birch and Ghost should be. Instead, the whole house arrest plot just feels like damaged control to explain away his imprisonment in Civil War. Other than the mechanical status quo change of Janet being back in the real world, it doesn't push the character emotionally, and it doesn't provide a satisfying spectacle. Anyway, now on to the next movie to feature Paul Rudd's Ant-Man. Die Hard? No, that's not one. Endgame. It's here during Endgame that you come to realise why the character works so well in both Russo movies. There's dark and tragic things occurring all around him for the main characters, but he injects the film with an appropriate amount of levity and hope. When Team Cap are officially on the run from the US government and their own teammates, a caffeinated Lang bounces off the walls of excitement, giddy to meet his fellow superheroes. He's a fan of Wanda and Steve, and his awkward reprisal with Sam is just charming as hell. Hey, man. What's up, Tic Tac? When you've kicked someone's ass and stolen their gear, just fire off some finger guns and everything will be A-OK. -okay. Even though we're at a point in the movie where everyone is facing off, Lang adds humour without it feeling misplaced. It happened again. They tell you what we're up against? Something about some... Psycho assassins? It feels right for him to have these reactions and generally be enamoured by this fantastical world he's only recently become a part of. As far as I'm concerned, that's America's ass. In Endgame, it's the same trick. After an opening 20 minutes where things go from bad to worse to even worse, Lang enters the story with no prior foreknowledge. We see the devastating effects of the snap through his eyes, but he reunites with his daughter and doesn't really bear the brunt of that emotional weight. He remains chipper, ready to boost the Avengers' spirits with a potentially game-changing way out of their predicament. He always manages to find Steve and Nat at their lowest and has an ace in the hole to save the day. Have either of you guys ever studied quantum physics? Only to make conversation. As comic relief, he's perfect because Lang's jokes never come in at a time where they feel unwarranted, nor do they ever feel disingenuous to his character. Most MCU characters deliver humour through snark and wit, whereas Lang is often a punching bag. Does anyone have any orange slices? Somebody peed my pants, but I don't know if it was baby me or old me. Or just me me. I love the little scared shift he does in his seat when War Machine lands. Oh god. Oh god. It's also just tragic when the kids don't recognize him as Ant-Man. They're Hulk fans. Wait, they don't know no, Ant-Man. No, oh, he well, nobody, does. nobody does. No, yeah, look, should. he's even saying no, he doesn't. Wait, I get it. On. Hilarious. No matter what happens, be it his tacos flying out the window or being forced to listen to the plot of Thor The Dark World, which is where I'm from, and uh, we had to try and fix her. Scott always has a smile on his face. His energy is infectious, and he's such a welcome addition in both instances. His usage as a covert spy during the Avengers Tower heist makes full use of his shrinking powers in the same way Civil War showcased his giant abilities. Flick me. So I think the problem with Ant-Man is that he works really well because he is so comedic, he doesn't tend to dwell on negative situations, and he provides an upbeat change to more sombre storylines. It works so well in the team-up movies because the conflict never hinges on him. The solo movies find it difficult to give him proper conflicts and a more comprehensive range of emotions, the kind of thing needed if an MCU soup is going to headline their own project. I think Marvel needs to stop being afraid to truly test Ant-Man. They need to put him through the ringer, destroy him so he can build himself back up. We need to love him because of his struggles as much as we love him because he's Paul Rudd standing next to the Avengers, cracking jokes. There's plenty funny about him, but nothing really tragic or affecting. The attempts to ground him via his daughter, his ex-con backstory, or his romance to Hope have all resisted really giving us something to chew on. His stories are always hesitant to challenge him. All the actors to play Cassie have been great, but it seems like Catherine Newton's version will finally be a 
a fully fledged character. I like the idea of Kang giving Lang the opportunity to regain lost time with her, as that's something he's wanted since the very first movie. And I love her so much. I've missed so much time and I want to be a part of her life. He's been in prison, under house arrest, or stuck in the quantum realm. He's missed huge chunks of her upbringing, and that beat could provide the third movie with a lot more thrust than we've seen before. So maybe Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania will be that fix. If this is his Winter Soldier or Ragnarok, and we come away from the movie with a new lease of enthusiasm for the character and his stories, then I don't see why it has to be the end. If Kang really disrupts Lang's life, then the title character will have plenty of grievances with the Conqueror when we move into Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars. Maybe Lang can go from a largely inconsequential character to one that spearheads the friction between the heroes and villains emotionally. Or maybe Ant-Man will continue to be the MCU character with just fine solo films and a couple of fun pop-ups across the more important instalments. There's been far worse MCU characters, at least Lang is guaranteed to bring some entertainment value. But seeing the way he's getting his ass kicked in the promos, his helmet crushed, Kang taunting him over his life and his daughter, that finally excites me for Ant-Man in a way that's been sorely lacking since 2015. Ant-Man's problem is that he's the schematic of a great character. If Quantumania doesn't provide an ample shake-up, then the Ant-Man trilogy will probably be the worst in the MCU, and Ant-Man should go back to being the comic relief in Avengers movies where he belongs. A big thank you to my full fat tier patron, Dr. Chike. If you'd like to donate money to my Patreon, you can find me at patreon.com slash fullfatvideos. If you'd like to find me on Instagram, you can find me at full underscore fat underscore videos. And if you'd like to find me on Twitter, you can find me at, at fullfatvideos.